thank you, Peter, for those um, far too elogious words. Um, and thank you also to the association for inviting me to, to speak to you this evening. Um, what you can see on the screen there is the gun that I'm sure you all know about, the, uh, the famous French uh, 95 millimeter. This was the um, principal artillery piece in 1914 with its famous uh, recoil system, which uh, enabled it to, uh, to fire very rapidly. I'll just give you a few details. It could fire 12 rounds per minute. It was pulled um, by six horses since it weighed 1,870 kilos. It could fire all types of shells. The direction of fire could be raised or lowered uh, minus 11 degrees to plus 18 degrees. And there were over 4,600 of these guns supplied to the 62 regiments of the French army in 1914. Um, a gun and its ammunition wagon was served by 14 men, six drivers, six gunners, a corporal and a sergeant. And the total effective of artillery um, men and officers in 1914 was getting on for half a million, 438,000 odd. The, um, that's a battery with it uh, being put into uh, position in Alsace in eastern France. And that is um, a 75 gun in position ready to fire. It must be fairly early in the war that the photograph isn't dated um, because they're, they're all wearing their, um, their flat caps, their soft caps. They would have had steel helmets <coughs> later on. The doctrine for um, the artillery at this point was, was to accompany and support the infantry attacks. They would fire on visible targets with the commanders communicating by voice or arm signals, rarely by telephone. Artillery observers were supposed to provide the communication with the infantry, but in fact uh, there, was in, there was very little liaison between the two arms, between the infantry and the artillery. And the other point to make is that uh, there was a complete, well not complete, but a near lack of heavy guns. The, uh, the French were supposed to be quick on their feet, eager to fight, uh, and needed something that would move quickly, um, the, the guns to, to support them. Now before I move on to uh, 1918, which is the, uh, the point of today's paper, I just want to make four points about what uh, developments between um, 1914 and 1918. Um, first of all, already by the end of 1914, Ferdinand Foch, whom you've probably heard of, my favorite French marshal, um, was uh, in charge of the army group uh, in northern France, combining a sort of overview of the British, French, and Belgian um, troops in northern France and Belgium. He'd recognized ex very early on at the battle of the first battle of Ypres at the end of um, October and November 1914. He'd recognized very early on that large numbers of siege guns were going to be required. He sent a letter to his commander in chief, Joseph Joffre, stating that he wanted a large supply of um, siege guns to deal with fortified enemy positions. He wanted mortars. He wanted other weapons capable of lobbing bombs into enemy, enemy positions. The 75s, of course, have a flat, more or less flat trajectory. He wanted mortars, and he wanted sappers for mining operations and digging equipment, uh, such as that that had been used for um, digging the new line of the Paris Metro. He also wanted more machine guns, and thinking of artillery tactics, he saw the need for counter-battery, this is normally seen as a British development in 1916, but he'd already spotted it by 1914. Um, he wanted to get the 75s as close to enemy trenches as possible, and he wanted what he called an intimate union between the infantry and the artillery, instead of treating the two arms separately. So already by the end of 1914, he's aware of the improvements that would need to be made. The second point I want to make is about... Um, Ministry of Munitions. Uh, as you know, David Lloyd George uh, became Minister of Munitions in, in Britain in 1915, and the French also. It was only an Under Secretary of Ship of State originally, but it became a, a ministry eventually to provide the ammunition 
the, mainly the munitions to cope with the shell shortages. This is one of my favorite photographs. Um, you've got General, as he was then, um, Douglas Haig telling David Lloyd George how to win the war. Um, the French Ministry of Munitions is the paunchy chap with the beard and the pork pie hat on the left, Albert Thomas. He's a very important character. Very little has been written about him, but uh, he, he deserves a proper, proper, proper treatment, I think. Um, he was very keen to coordinate with the British. Um, he gave a, an interview to the Times in, in, in London in 1915. When I first met the Minister of Munitions, um, Thomas said, we discussed matters from a general standpoint and exchanged great ideas, political and otherwise. On this occasion, we've dealt with this situation almost entirely as businessmen, and we have come to practical decisions which should prove of the greatest importance in the development of our plans for the manufacture of munitions of war. We are carrying our co cooperation so far that we are now able not only to foresee the execution of our respective programmes, but even the carrying out of a common programme, that's what's important, which will enable us to utilise to the utmost advantage the resources of both countries. He, in fact, made a practical suggestion, and uh, I'll mention this again later on, um, that they should create, the Allies, Britain and France, should create a heavy artillery system on rails so that it could be used along the whole length of the front from the Channel to the Adriatic Sea. Now, nothing actually came of that, but Albert Thomas is thinking, thinking big. The third point I want to make is that... Um, Technically, the French had started even before the war with um, things like flash spotting, sound ranging. Those are original funny um, orthophones for listening, and those are the sorts of equipment that was used for flash spotting. All this, again, started very early. Um, Charles Nordman was uh, uh, an astronomer physicist working with the 33. Third Regiment of Artillery, and he'd proved to headquarters by the 9th of December 1914 that his system did in fact work and could identify enemy batteries. And the fourth point, finally, um, Nivelle and Pétain, who were commanders in chief, Nivelle briefly in 1917, and then Pétain took over from him until the end of the war. Um, Nivelle created a uh, a heavy artillery reserve. Um, now, he did this because the 155mm gun, which is, um, that one is uh, parked outside Douaumont, the uh, Verdun, if any of you have ever been there. Um, this has now become the, the workhorse for the French army, and numbers of it are now being provided. So he suggested, uh, in fact created, um, a reserve of heavy artillery containing the the artillerie lourde de grande puissance, the, the extra heavy artillery, and also the railway guns. Um, it contained three divisions, had a total of 1,600 guns, and occupied 128,000 men. And that's one of the 155s. Um, being uh, being laid, the point is to uh, is to aim. Uh, notice the um, singly the uh, the pads on the wheels to enable it to uh, to be moved more easily. Um, they were always desperate to get caterpillar tracks, but never the French could never seem to get enough of them. Uh, and the final point I want to make is that um, Peter was a great one for training. He uh, set up instruction schools for artillery officers and um, on the 12th of August 1917 he ordered that a monthly artillery bulletin be produced and diffused to, uh, to all units um, with new te techniques, new tactics so that everybody could learn. He also appointed General Air for, um, to become an inspector general of the artillery, again with the aim of making sure that all new and interesting technical developments would be circulated. So, to 1918, which is the purpose. Uh, that first table there is the um, artillery in 1914. 
you'll see that the 75s, which is the second one down, there were 4,076 of those. Um, a few very old model heavy argon, heavy artillery, but the um, 75 is the, the, the basic, and there are 4,000 odd of them. This is the situation in 1918. Uh, there are still 4,746, uh, well, 4,968 75s, but below that you can see a, a whole range of um, guns. The 155s um, are the next largest section of guns. And if you look at the total, 12,148 field and heavy artillery in 1918 or at least on the 11th of November 1918. Uh, the artillery was organised around what they call pole, three, three types of artillery. First of all, the trench artillery, uh, and that's the famous uh, crapouillot, um, named for, for toads. It's, it's basically just a lump of iron with a feathered projectile, but it was, worked extremely well. Um, that's the famous one, but they had heavier types, 75, 150, 240, and even a 340 millimeter um, mortar. The second pole is the field artillery, which, as I said, has now lost its omnipotence. And a significant change in the field artillery was the conversion of horse-drawn batteries to, to lorries. They were able to put the 75s on, on lorries. Um, the original reason for this was that they, the shortage of horses, uh, but in fact it proved uh, rather useful to be able to move things about on lorries, and, and so um, the advantages of this were realised. The um, third pole is the heavy artillery, of course, where's the greatest change, as you saw from the numbers. Now the artillery could give strategic support rather than simply tactical support, uh, which which was all it could have done in 1914. The build-up was very gradual, of course. As I said, it was 1917 before the 155 came in in larger numbers um, because they'd had to, of course, deal with the, um, the shell crisis uh, earlier than that. Nivelle's heavy artillery reserve, in fact, became in January 19 a reserve of all heavy artillery with over a million men, uh, including 26,000 officers. It had five divisions, uh, in, and a sixth one, in fact, was created at the war end. It had 266 artillery regiments with over 12,000 guns. And one of those divisions was, in fact, um, crewed by, by the Navy. Uh, you can tell their Navy because of the red pom-poms, although you can't see the red, the red pom-poms on their berries. Um, they, uh, naval guns were used on barges. There are so many rivers in France that you could uh, do that. The Somme, of course, had got a lot of barges. Um, now, the, the whole point of this creating this reserve of all the artillery, which was non-organic, and I'll come to that in a moment, the whole point of this is that it's at the command of the commander-in-chief we, instead of having to negotiate to get army artillery from here, there, and everywhere, had the whole lot at his disposal so it could be moved quickly to where it's needed. Um, I'll just give you a quick note about the organic artillery. Um, by autumn 1918, a divisional artillery, artillery consisted of one regiment of the 75s, still being used, uh, containing three groups of three batteries, plus a group of the 155s. And the core artillery has lost its batteries of trench guns and now consisted of one regiment of heavy guns, uh, a group of 105s and a group of 155s, um, or double that if, if, it had, if the core had four divisions in it for a particular operation instead of the regular two. And the other role of the core artillery was to coordinate the divisional artilleries. But of course, taking over all the non-organic resources, everything which wasn't committed to a division or a corps, gave the commander-in-chief, as I said, much greater stri strategic mobility and initiative. And they're, they're also talking again about um, what Albert Thomas had suggested way back in 1915, creating an artillery, uh, an allied artillery reserve, 
Um, but in fact, it, it never actually um, happened. Uh, the Inspector General, General Herr, um, also was pushing, pushing for this. Um, now, the, um, okay, the uh, doctrine for the artillery has now um, become um, providing uh, an artillery bar a barrage, but a very short one, so that strategic surprise could be obtained. This was the principal purpose. Deploying the artillery quickly, of course, meant that um, this could be carried out. The long preparation, such as had happened at, uh, on the Somme, has stopped because it churned the ground out to churned the ground up too much and made it difficult to progress. So the the point of an artillery barrage became not destruction but neutralisation, um, and a large proportion of um, smoke and gas shells were used as part of that. Um, right, very quickly, the fourth pole, which I don't want to talk about, is the is the tanks. It's I've included it because it is French artillery. It's called the artillerie spéciale. But the Schneider and saint chamond are the old heavy types, and the Renault um, FT-17 is, uh, is the one which was produced in large numbers, 3,500, as you see. That's the old Schneider. That's the famous Renault, which lasted right until the Second World War. And that's the um, tank being crewed by Americans. What can I conclude? I've rather battered you with figures, I'm afraid, but I think the first point is, by 1918, we have a huge increase in quality and quantity, um, and there was even a projection for um, producing a program for producing even heavier guns with a longer range. France supplied lots of guns to Russia, to the Belgians, to the Serbians, and to the Americans specifically. And in fact, if you look at the figures of 75s for 1914 and 1918, there's not much difference. They did, in fact, um, build several thousand, many thousands of 75s, and they went, of course, apart from those that were destroyed in action, they went to, uh, to the Allies. The second point uh, to conclude is the um, huge increase in personnel and techniques. From 18.1% in 1914, the proportion of gunners in the army rose to 35.7%, practically doubled. Um, and, of course, the, the huge production I've uh, mentioned. Liaison between artillery and infantry was made much easier by the development of wireless and aviation. And the French also put their aviation into one division, uh, an aerial division, they called it, which could be used at the command of the C and C. Uh, may I just finally quote something about the Second Battle of the Marne, which uh, Roger kindly uh, introduced to us, the, the July, uh, 18 July counteroffensive after um, Ludendorff's final uh, attempt to break, break the Allies apart. That marked, there were tanks described as like swarms of bees buzzing around the battlefield. It was the inter-arms battle par excellence, the Germans recognised it as the Wendepunkt, the um, turning point of the war. The, the artillery barrage began at the same time as the infantry attack. It was, it was a complete uh, surprise to the Germans. They hadn't realised that the French were going to react quite so quickly and in such force. And it was an international battle with uh, Americans and Italians alongside the British and French. There were, in fact, some British in this battle, um, particularly General Sir Alexander God Godley's 22 Corps. Um, now, the British and French were getting a bit pissed off with each other, frankly, by this point, July 1918. Um, the, the French thought the British had run away in March and April, although, as we know, the Australians managed to, uh, to stop the, um, stop the, uh, the March attack. Um, and, of course, the uh, Godley's 22 Corps thought that they were being left to do all the fighting up the Ardre Valley. Godley wrote to Wigram, the, um, George V's uh, private secretary, on the 27th of July, 1918. 
that his men judged the French barrage supporting them, and I quote, this French barrage was the best barrage they have ever seen or have ever had. I think that's a good point on which to stop talking about the French artillery. Thank you.